Thank you. Thank you for the lovely welcome. Um, it's a real joy to be here. We've had one joyful service. I love the worship. Worship. You sing. Ah, oh, great. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm also very grateful to uh, Pastor uh, Rene and Pastor Jennifer for allowing me to come here and preach to you and uh, when they're not here. <laughs> That's a real honor. Either that or it says something about them and they don't want to be here, you know. Uh, but I think that's actually it. But it's a real honor to be here. Um, as, uh, as I was so ably introduced, thank you. Yeah, I, I head up Inner City Ministries, which works in Yamate amongst the Nepalese. We've been there. We've been in existence for about 20-odd years. Um, I've been the director for the last five years. And um, it's, a, it's a blessed ministry. So just to give you an idea, we're going to talk about mission today, which comes out of our experience. And so just to give you an idea, we'll, uh, we'll show you a quick, a, f a short film, okay? <laughs> joy is the source of peace, where should I look? It's you, Jesus. And this is for eternity. And I see here a lot of families, they don't, uh, they don't really care for the children, means of course they care their need physical, you know, like food and uh, food and clothing and school, but really to spend time with them and to teach them when they are wrong, if they're doing something wrong. Uh, so they think it's not necessary when they are young. So we thought if they go in the street or a park, they get, you know, involved with other stuff. So that's why we open our center every evening. So these children come to our center to do their homework. Now we are tutoring. Every evening we are tutoring the children because when their parents are at work and after school when they come back, there's no place to go for them. And when they go back home, there's nobody. On Friday night we have youth worship going on on Saturday uh, kids club and on Tuesday uh, family ministry we visit uh, people into their homes their houses house to house and we have a counseling ministry uh, that happens randomly uh, whenever our guys they just need help so they call us so we just attend them and uh, we pray for them and we counsel them for any reasons. God has been leading me and our ministry into um, training our young people, training our preteens um, into them having a stronger relationship with God but at the same time how that relationship with God will change their lifestyle and how they can actually involve God in their everyday life situation and thus see a change in their family system and I feel like focusing on this young generation so that uh, the second generation of people living in Hong Kong will have a, a God-based family and a good system that I'm looking forward to. My name is Nima and I'm 18 years old now. Yeah, before I came to Jesus but my life wasn't so good because yeah I, I, did, I really didn't have so much uh, friends out here as I'm new to this place and my life was quite frustrating I feel and lon yeah I was quite lonely and the brothers in the ICM they encouraged me and so yeah I could yeah, they told me about Jesus his love towards my life and he towards me so that he died for our sin and I really felt that touching and yeah as I came to the fellowship yeah, I could get a new community where I could build them as my family. We're expanding uh, to to appeal to uh, a wider group of adults, particularly the the, the women, um, who are a quite a disadvantaged group really in, in a whole series of ways both culturally and linguistically and we want to enable them to empower them. <laughs> I'm 
We are about mission, but we are also a care ministry, and we believe that both of those are inseparable. You can't separate caring for people without preaching the word. You can't preach the word without caring for people's circumstances. That gives you a very brief idea of, of our staff and what we do. So I'm going to uh, share some words this morning, but before we do, let's, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to be together. Um, thank you so much, Lord Jesus, that although we may not know each other very well, you know all of us intimately, Lord. Uh, you know our thoughts and our, our feelings. You know who we are. And because we are united in your heart, Lord Jesus, so we as brothers and sisters join together. We are known by you and known to one another for eternity, Lord. So we thank you. And so, Lord Jesus, may the words that I speak this morning, the thoughts of all our hearts, be always acceptable to you, Lord Jesus, in your precious, precious name. Amen. Lovely. We're going to talk about mission this morning, mission and transformation. Um, we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time reading from the Lord's Word. And I'm going to start by reading uh, Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 1 through to 12. Luke chapter 10. Okay. After this... The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send the workers into the harvest field. Go. I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Don't take a purse or a bag or sandals and don't greet anybody on the road. When you enter a house, first say peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating, drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is upon you. When you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that tan. Thank you, Lord, for your word. This uh, Bible passage is one of a number of Bible passages where Jesus sends, uh, first of all, generally speaking, the, t the 12 out, and then he sends out the 72. Um, just indicating that there's uh, a whole lot more than just 12 disciples. There were a whole lot more than just 12 guys, okay? There were a, whole, there were a lot of women who, who joined Jesus uh, because Jesus and his disciples, you know, they could probably cook, but the women probably cooked better. <laughs> and so they looked after them as they went around. So there were a lot of people. And <clears throat> so... One of the things that we need to understand is the mission transformation are closely related. Now I'm going to come back to the word transformation. Transformation is a wonderful word. It's right at the heart of our Christian life. It means one whole lot more than just simple change. Okay? But I'm going to focus on the way in which mission works through relationships. Okay? So, first of all, some statements on a PowerPoint. Okay? And then we'll pull it all together. First of all, we are transformed by relationships. We're transformed by relationships. Okay? Now, that, that's not a big, complicated thing. You get married, 
as Tom's going to do. You get married, you transformed. Okay? It's not just a change on the outside. It's a change everywhere. You give birth and you have children. <laughs> That's the biggest change. Okay? Because you're there for life. Okay, it's not my, ch my children, I have a 37-year-old daughter and a 35-year-old son, and I have three grandchildren. Yes, your life is changed forever. You meet a friend, somebody who gets close to you, you're transformed by it. We are transformed by relationships, okay, and relationships take two. Okay, you can't have a relationship of one. It's very boring, okay, it's a bit dull. Okay, so, second, second slide. Transformation is profound and lasting change from the inside out. Now, my illustration. Caterpillar to butterfly, okay? Now, a caterpillar's life is eating. That's what they do. They get fat. It's, it's a nice life. But it's a little dull. You just go from leaf to leaf, okay, eating it. And it's a good idea to get off to go to another leaf, otherwise you're going to fall off because you've eaten it. So, caterpillars move around, but they don't fly. You can stick a pair of wings on a caterpillar and it will not change it. It'll just make it look odd. But what happens is that Caterpillar is transformed. Now, it comes from the Greek word metamorphuo, which we use in English metamorphosis. And the caterpillar changes, but not just on the outside. It's a complete transformation because that becomes that. And it can fly anywhere. It can pick the leaf. It can fly over and go, hey, caterpillars, get a life. It can do anything. Some butterflies can fly up to 7,000 miles. The monarch butterfly in the US does the very same thing every year. 7,000 miles. It flies, it's transformed, it can soar. It's totally different. It's changed beyond recognition. Okay, transformation. Got that? Good. Third one. The Christian faith is not a religion, it's a relationship. Now this is an important statement, okay? Christianity is not a religion. I confuse people many times when I say this, so I will explain. Because people say, ah, you're religious, are you? And I go, no, I'm a Christian. And they go, ah. Uh. You see, religion is what humans do. Religion fills the gap. It fills the hole in us left by the fire. Because we, we know we need a relationship with something. And so we create religion. We create man's search for God. And throughout history, man has continued to search for God. And we've got a whole variety of religions and religious activity. But Christianity is God reaching down to us. God bringing us back because he wants the relationship with us that he always intended. That was always his plan. So Christianity, the religion, the, 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 the faith, sorry, the faith of Christ is not a religion. It's a relationship. The relationship with God. It's based upon a relationship. It's not based upon rules. It's not based upon ritual. It's not based upon religion. It is relationship. Okay? Next one. Mission is not marketing. Okay? We don't market the Christian faith. We're not marketing a relationship. We're not trying to persuade people that this is a good idea. Okay? We want lasting change from the inside out. We're not trying to persuade people that this is a good thing. It's sharing faithfully the gospel of grace. And lastly, relationship is the key to mission. Now this church is a wonderful mission-hearted church. 
I know that because I know Pastor Rennie for some years, and I know Pastor Jennifer as well, and I know what you do because he tells me, and I delight in it. We share month in, month out when we meet. And um, I know that the, the mission you've got in Sichuan at the moment, and also the mission that you had a few weeks ago in Hong Kong. Wonderful. But mission can only happen truly where there's a relationship. The idea of people swooping in, swooping out, and hoping that people are going to take some notice actually doesn't work. So, the most important thing that we need to focus on is relationship and how that enables mission to happen effectively. Before we move on, there are two types of mission. Two types of mission. The first one is the sending out. Now, sending out is what you, we read in the gospel this morning, where Jesus sent out the 12 or the 72. He sent them out. The word for sending out is apostoline, apostle. We get the word apostle from it. And anyone who's sent out, so Jennifer, uh, Pastor Jennifer is an apostle. She's going out in the name of Jesus. And sending out is critically important because sending out is a clue to the way in which all early Christians, are, in fact, how the church spread. People were sent out. They became missionaries. And we've got this idea that if you're going to go on mission, you become a missionary. And you must be sent out. But no, there is a second type of mission. And that is stay put, local, here, where you are, where you don't send anywhere. You do it where you are, where you are placed. Many of you are here because you work here. This is where you work. It's not your home. It's where you work. So you're here already. You're not being sent anywhere. This is mission where you are. Both of these types of mission are relational. Those who are sent out as we will see in a moment, will not be effective unless they create a relationship. And those who are stay put missionaries are, will not be effective either. So let's look at, the, let's look at our, our, our gospel reading first of all and, and see how this works. First of all, this is Jesus' plan for mission. And, and whenever Jesus has got a plan for mission, it's a very good idea for us to follow it because if we don't follow it, we'll mess up. First of all, stay in the place. So God, uh, Jesus tells the disciples, go stay in the town. Don't move about. Don't get distracted. Don't get chatting on the road. That's a very important issue. Don't get distracted. Go and stay in the place. Stay put. And that is very, very effective. M most effective mission in the world throughout the history has been when, where people have gone and stayed. They've stayed put. They've made it their home. That's why we stay and dwell in Yamate. We are amidst and amongst the people in, with whom we work and to whom we minister. Sustaining the place. Secondly, bless. Now this is a lovely word. Bring peace. Now in, in the English language, peace is actually a negative word. It's not a nice meaning, but it's a negative word. Because we, we understand peace to be no noise, no war, no children. <laughs> you know, I've got three grandchildren. They're three boys, okay? Uh, seven, five, and chaos. And, and they, you know, <laughs> yeah, boys, woo, 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 and when they go home, which is lovely to be a grandfather, you know, you, we, get, we get to go, bye-bye, go home with mummy and daddy now, hooray, shut the door, and <laughs> so peace comes back into the house, <laughs> and we tidy up the mess, and, uh, but it's lovely having them, that's not what I mean, but peace tends to mean the absence of something, okay? But in the Bible, in scripture, peace translates the word shalom, 
or in Greek, arene. And that is a very positive word. It means the wholeness of God. The completeness, the restoration, the very presence that God is. God brings wholeness. He, just doesn't, he doesn't bring absence of noise or absence of war. He brings wholeness, restoration. So when you come into a place, you bring peace. Why? Because you bring the presence of Jesus in your heart into a place. Now all of us live in a place. Yes? Unless you're all moving around in, under tents or something. Um, but you all live in a place. Therefore, you bring shalom peace. Or that's what you pray into that place. Thirdly, minister. You bring healing. Now, you can bring healing in a number of different ways. Don't get uh, wound up about the idea that I'm suddenly going to ask you to raise somebody from a paralytic position or heal leprosy or whatever. Um, that's not what it means. Again, healing means wholeness, saving. To bring healing can mean even a cup of tea. Because if somebody is feeling fed up, and they've had enough, and they've not had a great time at work, and things are down, and everything's going wrong, and somebody comes along and says, would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> what an act of healing that is. Because somebody's taken notice in a day that everything has gone wrong. To even go up to somebody and say, can I pray for you? Oh, what a wonderful thing that is. Wonderful thing. To say to somebody, can I Because I've never known, but I always do it with a cup of tea. So it's a good idea, you know. Cup of tea? Cup of tea first. Cup of tea first. Cup of coffee first. Sandwich first. Okay? And then say, look, you know, when they've had a chance to talk, you've had a chance to start a relationship, can I pray for you? But one piece of advice, don't suddenly go into sort of God language. Oh God, I just pray for our brother and sister. Because they're all going, what? And you start going, hallelujah, hallelujah. And, and they're all going, what, hallelujah? <laughs> if they've never been prayed for, don't use language they don't understand. Just, um, God doesn't need it. In fact, God's, you know, oh dear, off they go into this funny old language there. Just talk. Father God, thank you for Fred. Thank you for who he is. Just come into them now. Bless them. Heal them. Amen. They'll do. Don't go anymore. God doesn't need your help anyway. Okay? He just wants your partnership. Not your help. Okay. Bring healing. Bring healing. Now, ha ha, number four, then proclaim the kingdom. You see, you can't come in and proclaim the love, the good news of Jesus, unless it shows in your life that it is good news. Telling people about God may not be good news. Why? Because most people's version of God, which is why they reject him, is this idea of a judgmental, horrifying thing up in the sky that's going to go boom. That's not good news. I don't want to hear that. You should believe in God. Ah. Your sins will be forgiven. Oh, my sins. What are people trying to drink themselves so and so? Because they're, they're fed up with their sins. They don't want to try to run away. They go in there saying, ah, oh, your sins and this and the other. Oh, great news. Or if you go around with this sort of attitude that you're going to pray for everybody and you can spend hours doing it. Nobody wants to oh, spend hours. Do you know that one of the things that Jesus didn't say? Let us pray. He didn't. He said things like, let's have breakfast. You want a drink? Give me a drink. He said ordinary things to ordinary people, telling ordinary stories, because that's where they are. And he created a relationship with people. He, did, he was proclaiming the kingdom everywhere. But the first things first was he created relationships. He always stopped when somebody asked. 
Now, one of the things we need to do is have a sermon series called Walking in the Stops of Jesus. Not in the steps of Jesus. Walking in the stops of Jesus. Because Jesus always stopped for people. He never lost sight of the mission. And always stopped. That is a word for me. Because I'm forever up on the next activity. I'm always thinking about what i got to do next. And I need to stop. Proclaiming the kingdom. So that gives us an understanding that all of these first three are relationship creating. We create relationship through these things before we start proclaiming the good news. We are the good news before we proclaim the good news. That's a challenge to all of us. Are we good news in our relationships? Particularly with people we don't like. There's nothing here about like. Jesus doesn't ask you to like the people. He says love them. There's a difference. Okay? You may not like the people you work for. But you do have to love them. Okay? You may not like the people. You know, we all go to work. and We all go to work with people we don't know. Some of them we love. Some of them drive us up the wall. Some of them drive us. Oh, yes, I'll go and get another cup of coffee. Okay? But it's relationship that will make the difference. We create relationships. Okay. But let us look at this stay put one. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, I want to tell you about the first missionary. She was a... Okay, we don't know who she was. We don't know her name. The first missionary is accounted for in John chapter 4. The woman at the well. Now Jesus is traveling through Samaria, which is an unusual thing for a Jewish man to do anyway. It's the middle of the day and it's hot. Okay, it's Hong Kong hot. Only dry hot. And he's thirsty. All the disciples have gone off. And he sits down at a well. These were quite big places. Okay. Woman comes in. It's midday. Now that's very unusual. Women don't go and get water in the middle of the day. Stupid time to get the water. Because it's hot. Okay. But she's coming because she doesn't want to meet anybody else. And they don't want to meet her. She's not the, the village popular lady. Okay. So. And suddenly, this guy is sitting there. She doesn't know him. She knows he's Jewish. She's open to avoid him. And he says, could you give me a drink? <gasps> Can you give me a drink? What? You asking me for a drink? Yeah. Give me a drink. Do you see what I mean? Jesus didn't say, hey, let's pray. Let's have a little worship together. He doesn't say that. Let's sing a song. Um, he just says, could you give me a drink? That's such an ordinary thing to say. Okay. Now this woman's in. Yes, and then Jesus starts talking about living water. Okay, and she's intrigued. Give me some of this water. And he says, well, look, you go get your husband. And she says, oh, I don't have a husband. <laughs> he says, yes, you don't. You're right. Well done. You're speaking the truth. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with is not. Whoa! He's gone straight into the secret areas. Where I can see you are a prophet. And she's thinking, I don't want to talk to this guy anymore. Uh, well, you know, we Jews, we, we Samaritans, you Jews, she's gone into some argument about where you worship. Jesus is not interested in that at all. Let's get rid of the theology. Let's get straight to the relationship. And he carries on straight to her heart. And then what happens? Wonderful thing happens. She's been a Christian for three seconds. She's not out theological training. She doesn't know anything about Greek and Bible and this and the other. She doesn't know anything. She's lived her life exactly as it is. And what does she do? She leaves her water jar behind her. It's like leaving the bags in parking shop. <sighs> she leaves the water jar. That's why she was there. She's not interested in the water jar anymore. She's in such a passion. Why? Because she's going to back into the town and say to the people who she has been trying to avoid... The people who don't like her and what, right? They don't like what she does. And she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And they're probably thinking, hmm, could this be the Messiah? Good news. And it's all over her face. It's all over her face. Everything. And they all come out. Well, let's go see this guy. And they believe. She's the first missionary. Love her heart. But what does she do? 
She wasn't sent out. She went home. She went home, which is where we're all going to go later. Yeah? I hope you're going to go home, please. Um, okay? She, he, Jesus has built a relationship with this woman already, and he missions to her. She goes straight back home to the people who know her, but she's not concerned about her reputation anymore. She's not concerned with what people think about her. She's not concerned with whether they think that she knows everything there is to know about. Could this be the Messiah? She's just met him. You don't need to be a theological genius to be a missionary. You don't need to be knowledgeable in scripture up to your eyeballs in order to tell people about Jesus. In fact, frankly, you're better off if you've just met him. Because then his love will bowl you over. And your face will be full of the radiance of what it is. Which is why we're always radiant when we come out of worship. Because we come face to face with Jesus. So we're radiant. That's the time to go and sit and say hi. Okay? But this is also for the weak. So how does this come out of what we at Inner City Ministries do? Well, I'll give you an idea. We work in Yamate. Yamate is not one of the gorgeous parts of Hong Kong. Um, and that's some of our kids wandering rainy, rainy old street, Temple Street, that is. Okay, so we work in the environments where quite a lot of our Nepalese uh, people live. So how do we do it? We do it through things like sewing. You saw some of that in the video. We uh, enable our, we teach our, our ladies to sew. They bring the children, and um, during the sewing, they get to make, they, they, they learn to make dresses, particularly children's, children's dresses. And um, we've sent 200 dresses to a slum ministry in Uganda. We've sent dresses to Nepal, to uh, street workers in, in um, Calcutta. We've sent them all over the place. Um, these so it's really the poor helping the ultra poor, which is a wonderful empowering ministry for these ladies because they suddenly realize they're helping. But of course women uh, have a great ability. They can talk while they sew. Yeah? Now men can't. They either talk or sew. Yeah? Yeah? No, we can't do that. We either, I don't know about you, but I can't talk and do messaging. I can't do it. I got to do one or the other. Okay. Uh, but women can talk and look after children, make a cup of tea, and sew at the same time. <laughs> now, it's a gift. Um, and, and the talking, you see, you're sharing about Jesus, you're sharing. And so we get, they get to eat some snacks, because we, we have snacks all over the place. And um, they get to share about Jesus. And these people, are, they were Hindu when he came through the door. Okay, but when they go out the door, we pray that they're changed, they're transformed. Because the relationship, they come into somewhere that feels nice. Like this place. This feels nice. It's a lovely place. It's like a home. Let's move on. Cooking. We've had vocational training ministry. We do a lot of cooking. We do a lot of sharing food. Uh, you know as well as I do, you can't cook in a kitchen and not talk to people. Not in Hong Kong kitchens. Well, you're right. You move the pan, I'll do the kettle. Okay, because they're not big. A nice place up there. But you, you know, you meet and greet. You, you have food together. You celebrate. You can't sit down with people at a, around a table and not converse with them. It's relationship building. That's why I say to you, the first step out to somebody is, do you want a cup of tea? Would you like some coffee? Would you like a drink? Do you want something to eat? You want a McDonald's? Don't go there. That's, that's unhealthy, but you know. You, know, you don't want to say, come and eat something that's going to kill you. you know? um, okay, let's go on. Storytelling. We, we have our children come in, the, the ladies bring their young kids, and so there's quite a few of our kids just turn up on, on, on spec. But we tell them stories, we tell them stories from scripture, we try and enable them to play, we try and build relationship. But one of the most effective things is we have one-on-one -on -one relationships with them for educate. We're not really, we're not a tutor center, we're not trying to be a tutor center. We're trying to build relationships with these kids. So that, next slide. We can gradually train them into leadership, mission, ministry, performing, just like the, the things you were doing the other week in, in the local park. We do this, um, this is a, a big one we do. We do two big ones a year, uh, one at Christmas time, but we go out also on Temple Street about once every month um, just to take out mission. Same thing, drama, stuff like that, songs, go and talk to people, create relationships as, w as much as we can. 
And last but not least, with our teens, we empower them. That's, this is a, a residential in Camtin, in the Waiman base in Camtin. We create relationships. Now, they come every week to a relationship build. That's what we try and do. It doesn't matter whether they're bursting with, 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 with knowledge and love of Jesus. What they need to do is just come. Have some food, have a pizza, whatever. Very important. You see, because in the end, we can mission where we are. You don't have to go somewhere. You don't have to go into China. We do have to go into China, but actually only 10% of Hong Kong are Christians. 10% of Hong Kong are Christians. This city is lost. We need to minister, mission, to our cities, to our employers, to our employers' families. We need to mission. We need to share. Share the love. Share the love of Jesus in building relationships, in praying, in bringing, in blessing. Because, if you look at the next slide, relationship requires more than one. It requires that time and effort. It requires... It always involves transformation. Relationship is essential to growth. We do not grow without relationships. And relationship is essential to effective mission. So, lastly, Christian mission is the responsibility of every Christian. Not just trained Christians, not pastors, not missionaries, but every Christian. Now this is the one time when you say, right, well I'm going to pray about this. I'm going I'm to seek the Lord whether the Lord is asking me to become a missionary where I am. And I'm going to tell you, don't bother. I want you to become a Nike Christian. <laughs> okay? Even if you remember nothing else, when you go out that door, you're going to say, he told you, I'm going to be a Nike Christian. Okay? Just do it. I'll think about it. I'll mess around with it. Don't pray about it. Don't get spiritual about it. Don't get holier about it. Don't get anything else about it. Just go and do it. Because that's what God needs. Nike Christians. Okay? Good. Amen. Now we're going to sing. What we're going to do is we're going to let God work in our hearts just now. So what I'm going to do is, is just sit and play. I, I do love playing. I love your worship. So this is an honor for me to anyway do this. We're going to sing a lovely little song, This Is My Desire to Honor You. Paul said in Romans 1 chapter 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. So it's a sort of reverse way of putting it. It means we are honored to share the good news. So this is my desire to honor honor you. We honor God by sharing his love. And so what I would like us to do is we're going to sing this song and very gently let God minister to us in, through the Holy Spirit to give us direction to, to talk to the people that we need to talk to about or to pray about those people that we feel that we want to just create a relationship with or mend a relationship. So let's let the Holy Spirit work. I'll move the microphone so I can sing. Let the Holy Spirit just come upon us now and transform those areas in our lives where we want to show Jesus that we can honor you by bearing your word to others.
as we sing this together, Father, that you will have your way. That you'll have your way with our relationships, Lord. That you will have your way in our lives, Lord. That you give us the authority to go and bring the good news to those around us. You have the power, Lord, but you give us the authority. So sing with me as an act of prayer. somebody you should be texting to maybe repair a relationship through which Jesus can work or if the Holy Spirit is saying why do you write that email or if the Holy Spirit is saying or well, giving you a name just now the Holy Spirit has given you a picture of a group of people that you can make a cup of tea for or whom you serve every day and you can bring peace and minister and heal down your Holy Spirit upon this precious group of brothers and sisters. Lord, come. Holy 
Holy Spirit, empower and enliven your word in everyone's heart here. That, Lord Jesus, we may go out from here, that we can invite people to the movie. And even if we don't talk about you, Lord, we manifest your good news, Jesus, because we love you and you love us. You've loved us to the nth degree, and we want to share this, Lord. Have your way in me, Lord. And it doesn't matter what age you are. You don't have to be big and grown up. You can be 12. You can be a missionary at five. You can be a missionary at any age. Because love and good news is not a matter of age. So Lord Jesus, as we move into the, the worship and praise just to round off this service, Lord, may we go out shining because we have met you, Jesus. And we can go and see, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. This is Jesus. Messiah.